Greetings, everyone. Welcome back into Calc 2. We're getting closer and closer to the end. We're starting to build up multivariable calculus here. We're getting ready for that next stage of calculus. And to do that, we have to have a more generic idea of space. Not just the two-dimensional. Now we're going to upgrade to three-dimensional space. And this whole lecture is about 3D space and the vectors that we can use in three-dimensional space. Okay, so let's start with defining the 3D space. Remember, uh, the, the old space that you had before, the two-dimensional space, right, with the uh, x and y axis, like this, y axis here, x axis here, um, remember the, the way that angles would rotate on this particular system would be in a counterclockwise direction starting from that x axis, okay? In order to preserve this system, in our more generic 3D space, okay? Um, let, me, let me show you what I mean. We used to have the two-dimensional space, right? Like this, where this was x-axis and this was the y-axis, and our angles would rotate in this direction, right? Theta angles would rotate in that direction. This is the normal 2D Cartesian coordinate system, rectangular coordinate system, okay? To preserve all of that uh, structure, we're going to use what's called a right-handed system, which technically that 2D space already was a right-handed system, but you're going to see it even more now. This is what it means. If you have the, the 2D system, take your right hand and lay the back side of it on that axis. Notice that your fingers wrap in the direction of rotation of a normal angle from trigonometry, from whatever, right? So if I do my 2D space, notice this is that direction. Do you see the way your thumb is pointing? That would be considered the third dimension, the Z axis. And that's what this is. Notice the X axis is here, the Y axis is here, and the Z axis is here. I've mostly only drawn the positives of each axis. We, we tend to use a lot of those. But just note, the negatives would be going in the uh, opposite directions there, right? So the negative x-axis is going off this way. The negative y-axis is going off that way. Negative z is going to go downward like that, OK? And this is a right-handed system. You have to cant your head this way to see it the old school way. Remember, x used to be horizontal and Y used to be vertical. So you'd have to rotate it like this just to make it look like that again. In this graph, the Z axis is coming out, okay? So if you're, the way we're looking at this three-dimensional grid right here is sort of like this way towards this, right? If you're sitting on this grid, you're looking at it this way. So here's our 3D space and notice it's still a right-handed system. If I rotate from the x-axis to the y-axis like this, the same way as before, the z-axis is pointing up right there. It's what we call a right-handed system, and it keeps all of our structure and all of our mechanical mathematics the same, okay? All, all of it correct as far as everything you've been doing up to this point. We're going to keep with these right-handed systems. They work well with all of our physical interpretations of the world. Okay, so then a point in 3D space is going to have to move around the XY plane. The X axis and the Y axis are like the bottom, and the XY plane is that normal two dimensional space that you used to move around in. This is the XY plane. Okay, so if the Z axis is here, X axis, Y axis, right? Like this, then this is the XY plane. Incidentally, there's also a YZ plane over here, and there's also an XZ plane over here, okay? But the XY plane is where a, a lot of the places we're going to start from occurs, okay? So a point in three-dimensional space is going to move along your X. It's going to move parallel to the Y axis, and then it's going to move parallel to the Z axis. 
which of course any of these can be reversed, right? I can go negative X, I can go negative Y, and I can go negative Z. This is just a, a generic example of how you can get to a point in three-dimensional space. And it works the same way. I'm using round parentheses to represent a point, and I'm using the coordinates in the order that they're supposed to be X, then Y, then Z, okay? Now, because this is a rectangular space, just like the one you're accustomed to, it has to have a lot of the same properties that support a rectangular space. For example, you need to be able to measure a consistent distance. Distance can't fluctuate for it to be a normal solid rectangular system, right? That, that uh, have to go with your basic analytic geometry there. So in other words, uh, we have to have a distance formula between any two given points and it has to always consistently give the same distance uh, between those two points. Okay, well, you, you're familiar with the distance formula before between two points. It should come as no shock that all we're doing is adding another dimension to it. Okay, the, the distance formula here works the same way because you're basically doing the distance formula in the xy plane first. For example, if I draw a right triangle here, right, the right triangle right here in the xy plane, that's in that plane, then you can calculate this is the old distance just between x and y. That would just be this part. Then you can do another right triangle coming from the origin here up to the point itself such that this is going to be a right angle right here. Okay? That's a, that's a square right there. I have a right triangle facing inward there. In which case, if I square this bottom, I just get this. And then I have to add in the Z dimension. Okay? So our Pythagorean theorem still holds true. The distance between two points, okay, is going to come in the same way it did in 2D space. I've just got one more dimension to add into the mix, okay? Uh, a dimensional length is done with the subtraction, and then the squares along with the square root is how the Pythagorean theorem mixes together uh, dimensions in, in using right triangles. So if I have two points, I can actually compute the distance between those two points the exact same way. I just have an extra dimensional calculation there. Midpoint, again, not any different as far as the idea. If I want to find the point that's exactly in the middle and bisects the line that connects, the line segment that connects two points is bisected by the midpoint, okay? And again, all I'm doing is adding in a third dimension of the same calculation. And I should be getting three coordinates there because it's a midpoint in three space, in three dimensional space. Along with those, we typically talk about, uh, like if you were in college algebra, we would just define distance and midpoint in 2D space. And then next we would talk about circles because circles are the perfect shape and they're the, the way we can talk about areas on, uh, on a space that act as sort of like a neighborhood. You have to have the same idea in 3D space. You have to be able to have a neighborhood around a point. But in 3 space, instead of a circle, right, it would come out into your third dimension and it would become a ball, or in other words, a sphere. So the equation of a sphere, again, shouldn't come as much of a surprise. It's basically the same idea as a circle, and we've got one more dimension to add in. And that, again, comes from our distance formula, where we have some certain distance, and then we've got a center point, x naught, y naught, z naught, okay? And then the radius is the same in all directions from that center point. So if the distance is constant, I let it equal to that r squared like that, and I've got the equation of the sphere that has this point as a center and goes this distance away from that center point in all directions. 
Okay, so let's throw in an example here. Find the equation of the sphere that uses the points 4, 3, 2, and negative 4, 1, 8 as endpoints of a diameter. Now remember, a diameter on a circle, just like a sphere, are, is a line that goes through the center and intersects the object on either side. Okay, so if I've got a sphere, a diameter would just be something that goes from end to end through the center. And it doesn't have to just do it this way, by the way. It could also go this way, right, through the sphere. I just have a two-dimensional board and it's hard to see. But I'll show you all this in GeoGebra in a second. You'll, you'll see what I mean. We can get diameters to go in all different directions. Okay, so I've got a graph right here. Let's talk about, first of all, here's a good example of graphing a couple of points in 3D space. 4, 3, 2. So I went 4 along the x-axis. I went 1, 2, 3 parallel with the y-axis. And then 1, 2 parallel with the z-axis, you see. So it went, it went out, over, and up there. And then the point negative 4, 1, 8. On the x-axis, I go in the negative direction. 1, 2, 3, 4. I come out parallel to y here, 1. And then I go parallel to z, up 8 units, right? 8 units that far. Okay, parallel to z there. So here are the two points, and supposedly those are endpoints of a diameter. Okay, so in other words, there should be some sort of sphere encompassing those two points. And the center is going to be exactly in between those two because they're both points on the sphere and they're connecting at a diameter. Okay, so since they're connecting a diameter, right, my sphere right here, I know this is horrible drawing, horrible, horrible. The midpoint of these two points, however, is going to be the center of the circle. And then the distance from that center to one of those endpoints is going to be the radius. So I need to perform these two calculations. I'll need to find the midpoint in order to get the center of the sphere. And then I'll use the distance formula to get the radius. And once I have those two pieces of information, we'll write the equation of the sphere. Okay, so here we go. The center here is going to be equal to 4 plus negative 4 over 2. 3 plus 1 over 2. And... 2 plus 8 over 2. So therefore, my center is the point 0 divided by 2, which is 0. 3 plus 1 is 4 over 2 is 2. And 2 plus 8 is 10 divided by 2 is 5. So now I have the center of the sphere. Okay, next, what about the radius? Well, I'm going to do the distance now. Okay, to compute the radius, I'm going to say the distance between, right, here we go, I'm doing the distance formula here, between the center, so I'll have 0 minus something, 2 minus something squared, and 5 minus something squared. And then literally I could pick either one of those points, it doesn't matter which one. Okay, I'll just pick the first one. 4, 3, and 2, right? So 0 minus 4 is negative 4, squared is 16, plus 2 minus 3 is negative 1, squared is 1, and 5 minus 2 is 3, squared is 9. So altogether, I have that my radius is the square root of 26. I'm not going to bother getting a decimal interpretation of that because I don't need it. What I do notice from this statement 
is that r squared is equal to 26. That's actually what I need for the equation of the sphere. I need r squared. And I've got my center, so there's my x naught, my y naught, and my z naught. So then the equation is x minus 0, so I'll just put x squared, plus y minus 2 squared plus z minus 5 squared equals 26. All right, so I hope this gives you a, a good introduction to what 3D space is sort of like. Um, my drawings are terrible, so let me show you what some of this looks like in an actual 3D environment of, of GeoGebra. Here is a three-dimensional rectangular system. As you can see, the XY plane is grayed out because it's used sort of like a base. Um, but at the same time, we could also do the XZ plane Um, that's the YZ plane. We could do the uh, the YZ plane here or the XZ plane and that's all that those would be. Typically those aren't darkened in. So here's our, our 3D system and we were talking about points and distance and then also spheres. Notice when you're gonna graph a point on here you have to click and then you have to hold it down while you either raise or lower it above or below the plane. So here's one example of a point that I'm just graphing off the off the cuff here. And as you can see, it's definitely above the axis as I've as I've shown there. And if I wanted to, I could also click and go below. The dotted line is showing me below. And you can see it comes out below like that. Now let me fix the coordinates on these two points so that they can be the ones that we were talking about. Uh, 4, 3, and 2. There's one of the points. And the other one was negative 4, 1, and 8. So there's the other one. Okay, now the sphere that we um, concocted was supposed to have these two on either end of a diameter whose center was 0 to 5. Okay, so let's make an, one more point. Let's give it the coordinates uh, 0 to 5. right there and as you can see that definitely is the the middle of those two okay and let's do a line segment connecting point A to point B there okay and so C is in the middle of that segment now let's do the equation that we computed x squared plus y minus 2 squared plus z minus 5 squared uh, equals 26. And as you can see what we got is a sphere and that sphere is centered at the point C that we have there and the, the points A and B are both on the surface of the sphere here. So if I were to take a point and put it on the surface of the sphere, notice what it will do is it will restrict that point to where I can't take it off of the sphere, but I can move it all around the sphere. And then I could do a segment to the point C. 
and you'll notice the radius is 5.1 which is the square root of 26 and notice that that segment length does not change no matter where I move the point on the surface uh, of the sphere. Next let's use this new space that we've just talked about to generalize one more level up the idea of a vector. So we're talking about 3D space with vectors in them now. So of course we still have our coordinate system of points, but now any two points, if you, if you want to you know, have a direction from one to the other, or if you want to talk about a speed or a force or some sort of uh, quantity that requires both a direction and a, a quantity, right? So not just speed, I should have said velocity uh, or a force or uh, several other different things that we use vectors because of the complexity of some of the things that we need to describe, okay? So if I do have two points in space or if I just want to talk in general about a direction with a quantity, right? We still have the idea of vectors, okay? Something that has some sort of physical size and an arrow on one end to denote a direction that it's going to be moving in or pushing something in or causing something to flow in or whatever, right? You'll find that a lot of the ideas that we've already talked about with vectors in 2D space, two-dimensional space, generalize quite nicely into the three-dimensional version and the notation really doesn't have to change uh, we do have a couple of additions, <laughs> pun intended, um, some extra things that are in there now that we have more dimensions, uh, but all of the old stuff is still the same and is still valid, okay? So we still have all of our same terminology. We have our basic unit vectors, I and J from before, just like in, we did before in the, you'll notice in the XY plane here, right, that's in the floor. In the xy plane, I have i and j. And now I also have the vector in the z direction, k. The i, j, and k, all with a little hat on them, I'm using to denote the basic unit vectors. And each one is one unit in a singular dimension, right? i is in the x direction, j is in the y direction, k is in the z direction. And they make up our basic unit vector uh, system and any vector can be written as a combination of them. So if I have some vector V, right, between two points, just like uh, before with vectors, the way you can form a vector of components is you simply have to subtract the end point minus the beginning point for each dimension. So the X coordinate of D minus the X coordinate of C, the Y coordinate of D minus the Y coordinate of C, so on and so on. And that works for any number of dimensions. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay? So I can write it in this component form with the pointy brackets, right? Or I can put it in the uh, basic unit vector component form, VXI, VYJ, VZK. Both of those are synonymous, right? They're, they're interchangeable. They mean the same thing. It just depends on which one suits your uh, situation at the time. <clears throat> now, as I was saying before, all of the stuff, the ideas that you would have talked about in two-dimensional vectors generalizes nicely into three dimensions. Don't get points and vectors mixed up, just like before. Points are just you know labels and locations. Vectors must be labeled with arrows over their names and are typically in a different type of braces or brackets uh, versus not, you know, not using parentheses, okay? Sometimes vectors are even given as row or column matrices, but, uh, but the most, all the ones that we're going to be using here are going to be in the, either in the uh, pointy brackets or in the component forms, okay? So also using the distance formula that we just talked about and generalizing the idea of what we were doing with the length 
the magnitude of the vector, right? Before in two dimensions, it was just the square root of vx squared plus vy squared. So it should come as no surprise that we're just adding in plus vz squared, just like the distance formula between two points has that one extra parentheses squared uh, for just the z dimension, right? All of our mechanical processes dealing with Pythagorean theorem and whatnot are still valid and still line up here, okay? Adding two vectors works the same way. You're simply adding constituent components. Scalar multiplication also working the same way. It's like distributing in the multiplication of a number. Here I'm using lambda to represent some real number that I'm multiplying by the vector, and all it does is distribute to each component as a multiplication of a number, okay? The dot product, the basic definition of the dot product, you would have seen as just the, the two. Multiply the x's, multiply the y's, and then add that together to get some sort of scalar answer. So again, not, not much of a surprise to generalize dot product. I'm just multiplying the z components also and adding all of that together. Notice the dot product still gives me an answer that is a number, not a vector. Okay, so all of the properties of dot product still hold. In other words, if I want to do the dot product between two vectors in the alternate style that we already talked about, I can multiply the magnitudes and the cosine of the angle between the two vectors. Okay, in other words, this can be rewritten to calculate the angle between two vectors if I divide the length of V and length of B over. Okay, and then the, the more generalized um, Applications from there brought us to projection of one vector onto another. Having more dimensions does not change the idea that I can project one vector onto another space of another vector. Okay? And the formula is exactly the same. The, the way that this works is you, uh, even though I have three space, uh, like imagine a, a, a box, right? Even though I have a box space, and vectors in there, I can still line myself up, right? So here's your vectors. You would line yourself up in the plane of the two vectors, and then you're back to basically two-dimensional vector mechanics again. You're going to project in that plane one vector onto the other one. So all of the mathematics there, all the mechanical properties are exactly the same because you're actually doing the same process. Even though the vectors can be anywhere in three space, right? If you have two vectors, you can draw a plane that just contains both of those, a flat sheet. And then you're back to 2D space just for that calculation. So that's why all, all of this stuff still works the exact same way. Because if you're only dealing with two vectors, you're basically looking at the, the plane, the sheet that contains those two momentarily and it's still in 3 space, 3D space, okay? Unit vectors work the same way. If I have some vector and I divide him by his own magnitude, I create a unit vector in the direction of the V vector, okay? Orthogonal, remember that means two vectors that are perpendicular, basically. Orthogonal is a much more generic word than that for a, a lot of our more advanced linear algebra properties and things like that, but Right here, for right now, orthogonal basically means they're perpendicular. Two vectors that are perpendicular mean that their dot product is zero. That still holds. That's still the same uh, if and only if that we'll be using here for that. Okay, parallel, also the same as before. If two vectors are parallel, then one of them must be a multiple, a scalar multiple of the other one, okay? And of course, that scalar multiple can be one. V and B can be completely equal, okay? If, if these two are equal or if they're even just a scalar multiplication away, then remember that's component by component. That means that the VX component would be equal to whatever lambda times the BX component is in that particular statement, and so on and so on, okay? Now, something that is added something that is extra now that we're talking about three dimensions. If I've got a vector in three space somewhere, okay, 
the orientation of that vector can be described another way uh, rather than just an angle. In, in two space, remember, we, all we had was the rotation of the vector this way. And so we only needed to talk about the angle until the vector hits its terminal side. Basic trigonometry in the plane. Now that we're in three dimensions, right, I can go forward, backward, up, down, left, right. That vector can be pointing any which way throughout all of here, okay? It's not just this kind of angle anymore. Okay, I can't just do this angle to, to represent anymore. I also have this kind of angle, okay? I still have this kind of angle, all right? But I've also got uh, this kind of angle right here, and I've got angles that go this way like this too. Okay, so here's one way that we sometimes use to describe the direction in the basic 3D realm. We call it the directional cosines of a vector. And it's based off of the fact that the, the alternate version of the dot product gives you a multiplication of the magnitudes times the cosine of some angle. Okay, so notice if I dot the, a, the B vector, just some vector, this is some vector B right here, okay? If I dot B with the basic unit vector I, then all I will get is B X, the X component of the B vector, right? Because everything else will get zeroed out from the I vector. Same thing with J and K, but the other components. So what does that mean? If I take the alternate version of that dot product, right? The length of I is one because it's a unit vector and I can divide the B over, okay? So in other words, B X that I got from the dot product here divided by the length of the B vector is going to give me the cosine of an angle we're calling alpha. Now what is that angle? If you have your vector out in space, okay, and here's your x-axis. Well, if you look at the plane that that x-axis is with the, with the vector. Now the vector doesn't have to be in the x-y plane or in the x-z plane or anything like that. The vector's out in space. And here's your x-axis, okay? So whatever the plane that contains the x-axis and your vector, whatever this angle in between them is, okay? So whatever that, that is, whatever this angle strictly between the vector and the x-axis, that's this alpha right here, okay? Same thing goes for the other two axes. If you have my vector here and here's your y-axis, right? the angle between them is beta. If here's my z-axis and here's my vector, the angle in between them here is, where, is what I'm calling gamma, okay? Alpha, beta, and gamma, I'm calling these three angles. Those are uh, the directions. And when I divide the component that goes with that axis by the length of the vector, I get what is called a directional cosine, okay? The directional cosine, I can then also, if I wanted to, I could take the inverse cosine of both sides and find that particular angle. The angle would be part of describing the direction that the vector is facing, okay? And you can do that for any one of the dimensions, alpha, beta, and gamma. All you would do is change the component of the piece that you're using. And all of that comes from doing a dot product with a basic unit vector. Okay. One side note is if you square the, the three directional cosines and add them up, it does equal one. Okay, And that's because if you look at this, these are each a component in and of itself of the unit vector that would be created from vector B. If I were to find the length of the vector and divide it by the whole vector, right, the magnitude in the, in the bottom, it would go to each piece. This would be the x component of the unit vector, this would be the y component of the unit vector, this would be the z component of the unit vector, okay? And so, of course, if you square them all and add them up, you're going to get one because it's the length of a unit vector, okay? But also, sometimes this is handy when we're manipulating uh, different properties of our vectors, okay? So the main idea is 
we still have vectors in three-dimensional space. A lot of the mechanics, if not all of the mechanics that you've seen, transfers over into this higher dimensional space. All of it is going to be the same. You just simply have to accommodate the extra Z components in all of your calculations. Just consider that all of your vectors are going to have three components instead of two. And then those just have to be treated equally as with any of the other formulas. And then some added in ideas of directional cosines. Okay? So that's a start on, on the ideas of three uh, three dimensional vectors. Let's go look at a couple of examples. Let's get some quick examples of vectors in three space. I have vector V and vector A. V is the vector pointing in the directions of nine, negative three, four, and A is pointing in the directions of five, two, negative one. Remember those are not points. Those can be sli uh, slid anywhere in the 3D space and be parallel to themselves wherever they are, as long as the direction and the size of the vector is preserved, right? I can literally put those vectors anywhere. So it's not just the coordinates here. Those are components giving me uh, indication of direction, okay? Now, two vectors here. Calculate 3V minus 2A. So a little bit of scalar multiplication and some vector addition slash really subtraction, right? But uh, same idea, okay? So 3V minus 2A is going to be the vector uh, 3 times 9 minus 2 times 5 and then 3 times negative 3 minus 2 times 2, 3 times 4 minus 2 times negative 1. Okay, so then that results in the vector uh, 27 minus 10 is 17. I have negative 9 minus 4 is negative 13. And then 12 plus 2 is 14. So there's that vector. Okay. V dot A. Remember, you can only dot two things that are vectors. And these both happen to be that. Uh, v dot A is thusly going to just be uh, 9 times 5 plus negative 3 times 2 plus 4 times negative 1. So V dot A is 45 minus 5 minus 4. Uh, oh, did I say 5? Oh, 45 minus 6 minus 4, right? So minus 6 minus 4, that's negative 10. Uh, so I'm getting a big old 35 for that dot product there, right? Um, minus 6 minus 4 uh, gives me a negative 10 there. So I've got 35 for V dot A. A dot A. Now I wanted to throw this one in here because I wanted you to remember that whenever you dot a vector with itself, you're relating itself to its magnitude, right? So A dot A, which is actually going to be the magnitude of the A vector squared. A dot A is going to be 5 squared plus 2 squared plus negative 1 squared, which gives me 25 plus 4 plus 1 for a total of 30. Okay? So I hope you realize that what this means is that the magnitude of A is the square root of 30. The magnitude of vector A is square root of 30. While we're at it, let's go ahead and compute the magnitude of vector V as well. The magnitude of V, I have the square root of 9 squared, the, 
uh, plus negative 3 squared plus 4 squared. So that's 81 plus 9 is 90 plus 16 is 106. Square root of 106. Um, which, of course, we could try to simplify, right? What would that give you? 53. I'm not going to do so well on that. But let's just leave them like this. Square root of 106, square root of 30. That's really all we need. Those will be handy in some of the later calculations. Okay, so again, notice that all of this mechanical work is the same as it would have been in 2D. Calculate the angle between vectors V and A. Now, don't forget... V and A are not exactly in the X, Y plane or in the Y, Z plane or any of the normal, you know, easy planes. V and A create their own little plane. And whatever plane that is, there's an angle in between these two vectors, right, in that one sheet. And that's what we're calculating here, the angle between uh, vectors V and A. Okay, so remember the dot product alternate formula v dot a is magnitude of v times magnitude of a times the cosine of uh, theta v a we'll call it right the angle between v and a so what i'm going to do is i'm going to divide the magnitudes under the dot product and that's going to equal the cosine so the cosine of theta v a is equal to well, we have V dot A, that's 35. And then divided by the magnitudes, I have square root of 106 times square root of 30. So then to calculate the angle, I'm simply going to do the inverse cosine. Theta V A is going to be inverse cosine of... 35 over the square root of 106 times 30. And yes, I'm getting lazy here, right? So what, 3,180, uh, sure, which is approximately. And then this will give me the angle in between them. Okay, so I'm um, putting it in degrees for now. I have inverse cosine of 35 divided by square root 35, yeah. Fifty one point six three five five. So fifty one point six will do degrees. Okay. So fifty one point six degrees is the angle in between these two vectors in the plane that they create together. Right? In the plane that contains both of those vectors at the same time. Next, create the projection vector. This is the same idea. If I've got the plane that contains V and A, then I'm still just doing the projection of V, right, uh, onto the direction of A, whatever uh, direction that happens to be. Okay, so the, the calculation, as we saw before, was V dot A and a dot a uh, times vector a. Okay, well we've got v dot a and we've got a dot a. We have 35 over 30. So here w1 is 35 over 30 times vector a, which is the 5, 2, negative 1 vector. Now, of course, 35 over 30 is going to reduce to 7 over 6 times the vector 5, 2, negative 1. So then W1 uh, is going to be 35 sixths 
and then we'll have seven thirds, right? Because seven times two is 14 over six reduces to seven thirds. Uh, and then negative seven sixths is that vector there. And remember, the reason why I'm calling this one W1 is because we also sometimes with projection create W2, which is a vector that is perpendicular to W1 and also such that W2 plus W1 equals the original vector V, right? So if I have uh, the vector V projected onto A, right, if this is vector V and here's vector A, if I project V onto A, as we've just done, that just makes this piece right here diagonal. So here's that projection vector W1, right? So then W2 would be the perpendicular of that. Okay, such that W2 plus W1 gives me V back, right? W2 would fit in with V that way. And all of this is occurring in the plane of, of the V and A share, right? In whatever sheet that happens to be. Um, incidentally, don't forget the, the, the way I create, whoops, these should be arrowed. Uh, w2 is just gonna be the original V vector minus W1. Uh, the original V vector is nine, right? Minus 35, six. And then negative three minus seven thirds and four minus negative seven six. So W2 is equal to, do a common denominator here, that will give me 54 six and 54 minus 35 is 19, six. And then I've got negative nine and minus seven. So negative 16 thirds. And then here I've got 24 plus seven, 31 sixths. And remember, I can tell that even though this was formed with subtraction, I, I can tell that W2 is going to be perpendicular to W1 because I can take the dot product of W2 with W1. And once I take that dot product, they will zero out, right? Um, so on each one, you'll notice that if I just go ahead and make these sixths again, right? Seven thirds is really uh, 14 sixths. And 16 thirds is really a negative 32 six. And the reason why I did that is because I can, I can basically factor out the one sixth and just focus on the numerators here, right? So if I do uh, W1 dotted with W2, like this, then I'm gonna get the one sixth times the one sixth one over six squared times, uh, I just factored out the one six there. I have 35 times 19 uh, plus 14 times negative 32 plus uh, negative seven times 31. Oops. No brackets there because we're doing dot product here. Okay, and the one over six squared is not going to matter because it's going to be uh, if they're per like they're supposed to be. They're supposed to be perpendicular. It's going to be times zero. Uh, Thirty-five times nineteen minus fourteen times thirty-two. Uh, let's see, and then minus seven times thirty-one. Zero. Right. So this does actually equal zero, which shows that W1 is perpendicular to W2.
And of course, I know it didn't ask for W2. This was just a quick reminder. But notice all of this still works in three-dimensional space. Okay, next. Create a B vector such that B is parallel to A. There's lots of choices here. But literally, all I have to do is just pick some value, some number, and multiply it by the A vector. And it will be a parallel vector to the A vector. And it can literally be placed anywhere. That's what, that's what also could make it more parallel, right? So the A vector is 5, 2, negative 1. And let's say I pick, uh, you know, 5. Right? I could have literally picked any number. Okay? Here, the, the lambda can be any real number. Hell, it could be a complex number, too. It doesn't, doesn't, doesn't have a restriction there. Okay? But that's just the one I picked. I could have picked a negative number, even. It would just be kind of what we call anti-parallel because they'd be pointing opposite directions if you picked a negative, but technically still parallel as far as being in the same linear uh, direction or same linear lineup, I should say. Okay, so then I've got the vector 25, 10, negative 5 for that particular example. Next, create a vector P such that P is perpendicular to V. And just like the one I just did, I've got several options here that, uh, that you can go through to, to make this work. Okay, before my options were picking just whatever number I wanted to, to multiply. Here, making something that's perpendicular just means that I need to create a P uh, such that if I were to dot it with the vector V, I'm going to get zero. Okay, so I just got to make that happen. Well, P is going to be equal to something, right? And then I'm going to go ahead and just write the V vector underneath of it to help me visualize. So that's 9, negative 3, 4. Okay, the easy way in 3 space to create a perpendicular vector is to zero out one of the components. It's sort of like cheating, right? So right here, if I just zero out the four, so zero it out, and then swap these two, three and nine. But notice, not only did I swap them, but I changed the sign on one of them, not both. I changed the sign on one of them. And what I get now is a vector when I multiply these, notice I get 27, minus 27 plus zero. So when I dot these two together, I get uh, a zero, okay? Now, of course, you could literally pick just about any number you wanted as long as you could make the rest of it sort of balance out uh, in a way. But this is the easiest way to do it, right? To zero out one of your coordinates and then swap the other two uh, if you're creating a perpendicular vector. Okay, and then lastly, calculate the directional cosines and the three angles that go along with those, the alpha, beta, gamma angles for vector A. Okay, so for vector A, the cosine of alpha is going to be AX divided by the magnitude of A. Well, AX is 5. And the magnitude of A is the square root of 30. So that's 5 over square root of 30. There's one of your directional cosines right there. Right? Cosine of beta is going to be the AY over the magnitude of A. So that's 2 over square root of 30. There's one of your directional cosines. And then the third one, cosine of gamma uh, for the vector A, is going to be negative 1 over the square root of 30. Okay? Now let's compute the angles. That's uh, calculator punch away, right? Okay, so right here I know my angle alpha 
would have to be approximately whatever the inverse cosine of 5 divided by square root of 30 is. 24.09. So 24.1 degrees. Okay, what would my beta angle have to be approximately? In my calculator, I just hit up, change the 5 to a 2. All right, so I get 68.58 degrees. That'll work. And then lastly, the gamma angle for vector A. Right, gamma for vector A is if I change this to a negative 1, and I get 100.5. 1.9, so about 100.52 uh, degrees, okay? Now, note, these do not add up to anything special, okay? Don't make the mistake of saying, oh, these are going to have to add up to 180. It's not a triangle, okay? These don't form that kind of thing. These are the directional angles uh, that that particular vector is doing. Think about what it is doing. 5, 2, negative 1. It's going to come, if you, if you just have the coordinate from the origin, 5, 2, negative 1, right? 5 is going to come down the x-axis. 2 is going to be parallel to the y-axis. And then z is negative 1, so it's going to go down. So if you have your x and y-axis and you're facing it like this, you're going to have a vector going out and, and just down a little bit like this. So here's your z-axis, right? It's got a 100.5 degree angle from here to here. But then also from your x-axis over here, you've only got a 24 degree angle. And then from your y-axis over here, you've got 68, almost 69 degree angle here, right? Okay, so that's the directional cosines and angles for vector A in this case. Here's our vectors V and A. Right, V is 9, negative 3, 4. A is 5, 2, negative 1. And we're going to look at a few of the things that we calculated. First of all, notice the plane that contains both of these vectors is this plane here. And to better view some of these things, I can actually turn the XY plane off so that you can see the two vectors in the plane there. So then what about the angle between these two objects? You can see the angle right there that we've computed is the uh, 51.64 that we already calculated on the board. Um, also, if I pull up the other vectors that we created, um, such as the B vector, which we created to be parallel to A. Notice they're right on top of each other right here. B is just five times as long as A because of the way we scaled it. So those two vectors are parallel. Vector P on the other hand, if I turn off A, you can see, vector P on the other hand is at a 90 degree angle with vector V. I'll do the two vectors on that one. Right, you can see it's at a 90 degree angle there. Okay. So then next, we were also interested in the directional cosines uh, for vector A. So here's vector A right here. You can see it's a little bit beneath the plane there. And so what we're going to do is 
show the angles uh, to the axes if we can oh goodness Let's see, so if I were to do the angle of vector A and uh, the vector 1, 0, 0, you can see the angle there to be the 24.09 that we computed before. Uh, next, what I can also do is just change this up, because notice what I did was the angle with vector I, which is the x-axis, to do J, I would just do 0, 1, 0, and notice it changes to the 68.58 that we computed, which you can see that angle right here with the Y axis. And then lastly, I could switch this up to being the K vector, 0, 0, 1, and it would give me the angle between the vector and the z-axis there, the 100.52. Okay, and then uh, lastly we talked about the projection of v onto a, and what we computed was a vector, we'll call it w, and that vector was the coordinates 35 over 6, 7 over 3, and negative 7 over 6. Okay, so in a certain way what you need to do is look at it this way. And if I turn on the plane, there you can see it. It's completely in that plane there. And at a right angle here, it is the length of the blue vector projected into this direction here. You can see that it would be a straight orthogonal uh, angle here. And the, the blue vector is getting projected into this right here. Of course, the other vector that we found, uh, I'll call it W2 <clears throat> was 19 over 6, negative 16 over 3, and 31 over 6. And you can notice how those two make an orthogonal pair, the W and the W2 there. And we actually computed that already on the board as well, that those two are at a right angle. Notice that this all took place in the plane that contains the original two vectors, V and A. That's what this green plane is. I created it from those vectors, V and A. It's the plane that, co uh, uh, that contains both of those vectors. But notice the projections, the angles uh, between the vectors, all of the other things that have to do with it other than the... Uh, directional cosines. Uh, they're all inside of a plane, which is what we typically do uh, when we're doing two dimensions anyway. So 3D just allows us to cant those planes whichever way we want, really. Now it's time to expand even further into this three-dimensional world with vectors. This is something that only comes up in three dimensions, and now that we're here, it's something very important that we need to discuss. It's called the cross product. See, once we step out of the world of just scalar numbers and into the world of vectors representing our quantities, we have a much more complex interaction between vectors than we do just plain scalar numbers. And you've already seen that a little bit with dot product 
uh, even in two dimensions, uh, also with three dimensions, the dot product is sort of one of those things that you have to try and visualize. It is a relationship between the two vectors, not just multiplying the quantities themselves. It has a deeper meaning. The cross product is yet another type of multiplication of vectors. This one, however, gives a vectoral answer. You will get a vector as an answer here, and it's not just any vector, it's a special vector. Okay, if I cross product V vector with A vector, V cross A is what we say. Okay, what we get is a vector that is orthogonal, perpendicular to both V and A, okay, using the right-handed setup method. Okay, so in other words, if I've got two vectors, okay, I'm going to cross V into A. Let's say V is the red and A is the blue. Then V into A gives my thumb upward like this. So V cross A is going to share this point and point perpendicular to both of them. Basically think of the plane that has V and A in it and the cross product will be perpendicular away from that plane. It will be pointing exactly at a right angle from the plane that contains V and A. However, if V is the blue one and A is the red one, what you should notice is that crossing V into A makes the cross product point in the exact opposite direction. So it probably will be the same numbers, but it will be all the opposite signs. Okay? So it's important to note that V cross A and A cross V is not the same thing. In fact, V cross A is the exact negative of A cross V. Now how do we compute these? Here's the actual formula for it right here. You have the, the three components as you can see here. This is the X component, the Y component, and the Z component. Uh, the pattern to it is you don't use the component of the one component you're calculating. So in other words, uh, since this is the X component of the cross product, notice there are no X's, right? And then the order in which you use them is firstly the order of the cross product, so notice VA, and then reverse, minus AV, right? And then not X, but do them in order, so YZ, and then minus do, you know, it's the reverse order, so AY and VZ, okay? Y component, don't use any Ys, in order VA, minus reverse order AV, X, then Z, X, then Z. See the pattern going there? That's if you want to just memorize the formula, which I'm always terrible at. The definition that we've also given this in order to generalize it into our world of vectors, which gets generalized into uh, when we study linear algebra, we treat the cross product of two vectors as the determinant of the three by three matrix formed when you use i, j, and k, the basic unit vectors, as the components of a vector, okay? Not, they're not numbers, literally the, the vectors themselves, i, j, and k, but then all of the other spots are the components of the vectors v and then vector a. Notice row here is all of v, and this row here is all of a. If you do this uh, determinant, you will end up with these pieces, okay? Now, I'm gonna be using what's considered the shortcut method for the determinant of this three by three. Um, some physics people prefer a different method. Some physics people prefer just the plain out formula. It's whatever situation calls for at the time. Since I don't need to go to any higher dimensions of determinants here, I'm just gonna be doing three by threes the whole time. I prefer the shortcut uh, simply because it saves space, it saves time, and, and it keeps my brain uh, organized, okay? So what is the, um, the shortcut method, Mr. Simon? Well, this is what it is. You take the components. This is for any 3x3, three by, three, by the way, not just uh, cross products. You take, any, uh, um, you take the first two columns here, and you rewrite them over here. So that would be I hat and J hat, VX by, uh, ax, ay. After you rewrite those two columns, 
then you perform a series of diagonal multiplications. And anytime you go from an upper left to a lower right, it's what is considered a positive multiplication. And if you go from a lower left to an upper right, it's a negative multiplication. Okay, so here, notice that what I get is I times VYAZ, and that's a positive. So I, okay, this first component here is the I component. All right, this component is the J, and this one is the K, right, of the cross product. So I, V, Y, A, Z. See, there's V, Y, A, Z. Okay. Now, notice right here, here's a, a negative diagonal. Minus A, Y, V, Z, also with I. Right, so minus A, Y, V, Z. Okay, now, let me go ahead and do it in order, though. Here's what you do. When you're doing this determinant, you do uh, any anytime you can do three in a multiplication. So here's a positive, um, here's a positive, and here's a positive. Those three are my positive multiplications, those three. And then you also do your three negatives. Okay, so that would be this way, the one we already drew, and this one here. And those, all three of those would be negatives. Okay, and then just look for the crossovers, right? So like we just did, the, the I right here crossover with this I gives me this subtraction. Um, and then this J right here with this J right here, right? I get VZAX. Um, yeah, there we go. The, the VZAX uh, right there. And then, um, where am I at? Oh yeah, J right here. And then the, uh, the other J right here, uh, I've got the, the VX and the AZ. Okay. Uh, it would seem I may have... Yeah, okay, anyway. So th this is the way that I'm going to be performing this right here, this particular one. Okay. So then... Sorry guys, uh, I, I hope you caught me on this one. Uh, th this is why I do this and I don't have these memorized. These are backwards. This should be Z. It always happens with these middle ones. Um, because of the, the way it's in the middle, it actually is supposed to alternate sign. Um, notice it's J, V, Z, A, X, V, Z, A, X. And uh, then right here, J, right? I have AZ, VX on a minus, AZ, VX. So I'm, uh, uh, if you've never seen it before, then I'm correcting it now. And if you have, I hope you caught me beforehand. Um, that's what I get for, for trying to read stuff out of a, out of a book. They, they had a big minus in front of it. And I don't memorize these formulas like this. They, they don't, it doesn't make sense for my brain to memorize stuff. That's why I have these, these formats. Okay. <clears throat> so this this is the way I'll be doing my cross product right here. Uh, next, something to note: you can do the magnitude, the size of the cross product vector, okay, without doing the full cross product. Um, the way you do this is you have the magnitude of v, the magnitude of a, and you multiply them and you multiply times the sine of the angle in between them, okay? So if you multiply sine of the angle that's in between the two vectors, right, the angle that's in between the two vectors, and then times the two magnitudes, that should sound familiar, right? Remember the dot product was these two multiplied times the cosine of the angle, right? Okay, so yeah, there, there's, a, there's a connection there uh, for... Uh, for the, the, the connection between the dot and the cross products there. Another way of interpreting this particular equation right here, this particular property, is that if you had the vectors A and V, then performing the cross product and just getting the magnitude of that vector, getting the size of the cross product, gives you the area of a parallelogram that A and V form. 
right? So if I've got my two vectors, V and A, and I do the cross product and I get some vector, whatever the size of that vector is, the magnitude, the length of it, that's also the amount of area that's in this particular parallelogram that A and V will form, okay? And that's just simply a consequence of the way you do the area of a parallelogram where it's the, the height uh, times the base right there, right? The base right here is the, is the magnitude of V, and the height right here using this angle is the uh, magnitude of A times the sine of the angle, because the height would be right here. And that's really all it is, it's just a consequence uh, of the way A and V are set up there. Uh, however, if it's easy enough, to, uh, like maybe you don't have the angle between them, but it's easy to get the cross product, then sometimes that's an easier way to compute areas of these parallelograms. Okay. Some other quick properties of cross product that you might expect, uh, as we already talked about, if you reverse the order in a cross product, you will change the sign. Okay, and actually that, that has a lot to do with the way these subtractions are working and also why I'm, I'm, my head was jumbled on that uh, formula there, but I don't memorize it that way, this way. Okay, I always remember this though. Um, distributive property should make sense, right? B cross the addition of two vectors, V and A, would give me B cross V plus B cross A. That's just a distributive property, and it works just the same as any other multiplication with an addition. If I have scalar multiplications, some number C and some number lambda, and I'm doing the cross product of these, then basically I can do the, these two multiplications afterwards and just cross V and A vectors. You get the, the, the same result there. Okay? Now, anytime you cross a vector with the zero vector, now be careful here, this is not the number zero, it is the vector zero. In other words, zero comma zero comma zero vector, not just zero. Okay, this is a zero vector, which is, has a zero for all of the components in a vector. Then you receive the zero vector as an answer, because remember, cross product has to give you a vector. Okay? Also, you'll receive a zero vector as an answer if V and A are parallel, okay? For example, if you do V crossed with itself, you get the zero vector, okay? Crossing a vector with its own self does not result in anything. And something called the triple scalar product. If I want to dot a vector B with a cross product of V cross A, then that's exactly the same result as if I cross B with V and dot it with A. And actually there's, there's other combinations as well. As you can see, I'm, I'm shifting the stuff around. One thing that's important between these two though is you notice the B, V, and A, the order doesn't change, okay? If I change any of the orders of these, there's gonna be some negatives floating in there, okay? We're gonna use triple scalar product in, in a second. I'll show you an application that involves triple scalar product and an easy way to compute uh, these particular calculations, okay? Now, an example, compute V cross A. There's our two vectors from last scene, right? Let's do the cross product of these two and see what we get. V cross A, V cross A is going to be the determinant of I, J, K, in the top row, and then V is nine, negative three, four, A is five, two, negative one. I'm going to rewrite my first two columns, I, J, nine, negative three, five, and two, and then I'm gonna multiply. So I've got I times negative three times negative one. V cross A, uh, that gives me 3I. Next, I've got 20J. And lastly, for the positive ones, I have 18K. Next, I've got minus 
negative 15 K. So that's plus 15 K. Notice it was a double negative. Next, I've got minus two times four, minus eight I, so minus eight I. And lastly, I have minus negative nine J. So that's plus nine J. Oops. Okay, so V cross A is the vector negative 5, 29, and 33. Okay. Well, let's double check it, right? If it's truly the cross product as we've been stating over here, then it should be perpendicular, orthogonal, to both of the uh, vectors that I used to create this thing, okay? Well, let's dot them. If I do V cross A dotted with A, right? That's gonna be negative five times five. So negative 25 plus 29 times two, so 58, plus 33 times negative one, so that's negative 33. Notice negative 25 and negative 33 add up to a negative 58, plus 58 gives me zero. So this is definitely perpendicular to vector A. Now what if I do it the uh, other one, V cross A, dotted with V. Okay, so that's negative five times nine is negative 45, plus 29 times negative three is going to be, uh, let's see, 90 minus 387. And then lastly, uh, 33 times four is plus 132, okay? So negative 45 and negative 87, notice that adds up to a negative 132, plus 132 is of course zero. So as promised, the cross product vector is orthogonal, perpendicular to both of the two vectors used to create it, meaning V and A may not be at a right angle to each other. They're just two vectors out anywhere, right? And actually, we, we computed the angle between them earlier. They're not at a right angle with each other, okay? But when you cross product, the result, right? The result that we get, V and A are just some angle, but the cross product is perpendicular to both, okay? So very quickly, go take a look at what that looks like in GeoGebra. And then let's grab a couple of other examples of some of these other things that we can do with cross product. So let's take a look at what this cross product looks like. I've got the two vectors here, V and A again. I'm gonna turn off the XY plane shading so that you can see the two vectors there. And then the cross product, it has this weird symbol in GeoGebra there. Uh, I actually had to type in the command cross, but uh, it shows as this. And I want you to notice where it's pointing. It's actually at a right angle with both the V and A, both the blue and red vectors. But it's so much longer because you have to remember it's light multiplication. It's like I'm multiplying those two vectors or at least portions of them. Notice then the, uh, the way that the plane would be between vectors uh, V and A. If I take the plane that has 0, 0, 0, and vectors V and A. That's the plane that has the original two vectors in it. Notice that the, the cross product is actually at a right angle to that entire plane. 
And that's one of the um, more advanced topics that we begin to talk about uh, in multivariable calculus, and it's how to make the equation of a plane using a vector that is perpendicular like this. So we end up using the cross product quite a, lit, quite a bit to create planes. One quick application of the cross product is within the triple scalar product, which has one very specific application that comes out a lot. Uh, the volume of one, um, a, a slanted rhombical diamond, if you will, type of shape called a parallel pipid. Parallelipipid or whatever way you want to parallel it piped. It's, uh, it's pronounced several different ways that I've heard. Um, it's basically if you take three vectors, right, three vectors, and you, you form parallelograms between every pair of them, and then extend each of those parallelograms in uh, filling in the volume, right? Uh, I have these three vectors that are pointing just in different directions of space, right? And I've just formed a parallelogram between the different sides, the top, bottom, and sides and just extend it out uh, to the opposite point, right? So you get this um, sort of 3D diamond-ish kind of shape, right? Um, the triple scalar product is when you dot a vector with a cross product. And the easy way to calculate that is to realize that when you do a cross product, you have an i, j, and k in one of your rows. And if you dot a vector with i, j, and k, all you get is its components. b dot i is bx, b dot j is by, b dot k is bz. So all I need to do is the determinant of this three by three matrix where a vector has taken the place of the i, j, k row, okay? And then actually, uh, since it's a volume, if you're gonna do a volume, uh, then you're going to use absolute value, okay? Just, um, I'll, I'll put a little note right here, uh, use absolute value. Because when you're doing these um, determinants, they can come out positive or negative, and it's easy to, to, to mix it up if you swap them. Now, the actual triple scalar product doesn't have to be put in an absolute value, that's a, that's a generic math idea. However, if you apply it to the volume, that's when you would bring out an absolute value. In other words, drop any negatives that occur. Okay, so here we go. Compute the volume of the parallel pipe formed with these three vectors. Okay, so I'm just going to do the triple scalar product with these three vectors. Okay, so uh, basically, I'm just doing B dot V cross A. Notice that it doesn't really matter which ones I pick for where, especially since I'm going to end up dropping off any negatives anyway. And as we've already seen from our properties, there's a couple of different ways even to set up the triple scalar product to begin with, right? Each vector is going to be a row in your determinant. That's pretty much the way it works. So I have 0, 4, 7, 9, negative 3, 4, 5, 2, negative 1, determinant. I'm going to copy those two rows as I've done before. Oh, I'm sorry, columns, not rows. 9, negative 3, 5, and 2. Copy the first two columns. And now I'm just going to do my diagonals. Uh, so I've got 0, and then I've got... 16 times 5 is 80. And then I've got 7 times 9 is 63 times 2 is 126. Okay, next I've got minus negative, right? And then that's 5 times 21. So 105, so plus 105. And then I've got plus zero, so plus zero again. And then right here, I've got minus negative nine times four, basically, so plus 36. Okay, 
So 80 and 126, that's 206. Plus 105 is 311. So then plus 36, 311 plus 36 is 347. Came out to be positive. If it was negative, I would have just used the absolute value since we are talking about a volume. Right? So then it would just be whatever units cubed, so cubic units, right, would be the volume of whatever uh, fat or skinny diamond type of shape that this is, the, uh, this is forming, this parallel pipe that, that these three vectors are forming. Okay? Just real fast so that you can see what's going on. The, uh, the vectors are colored there, blue, green, and red. Um, uh, I'll turn off the axes too so that you can see. Those three vectors here, the green, the blue, and the red, are the original three vectors of V, A, and B that we were just discussing. And as I'm connecting up the rest of these nodes, this shape right here forms the parallel pipette that those three vectors together form. And the volume contained inside was the quantity that we calculated uh, the 347 units, uh, cubic units. I'd like to finish up with a physics application of cross product for you. Something that's used quite a bit in physics is forces that cause rotation. In, in this example, what we're computing is something called torque. And you've probably heard this quite a bit. You hear it a lot with engines, you hear it a lot with tools, uh, power equipment, all those sorts of things. Um, torque is basically, in physics, defined as the moment of a force around a point. And what that means is the amount of sort of like energy being put into forcing something to rotate okay now that's if a force is applied and we're talking about at the moment of application so it's sort of an instantaneous thing um, not necessarily uh, gonna be talking about a change just yet you can um, talk about changes in torque and do derivatives and things like that that's where you start getting into uh, angular momentum and uh, conservation of angular energy and things like that that's not what we're talking about here. Okay, so torque is going to be a force, sort of. It's, it's going to be a vectored quantity is, is probably more uh, what I should say. It's a vectored quantity, okay? Uh, not a force, but a vectored quantity. And it's computed as R cross F. Now, what is R and what is F? R is going to be the radial vector from the point of rotation to the point of application, okay? So the, the radial vector is coming from where the thing is rotating out to where the force that's causing the rotation is being applied. And then the force, of course, being the vector of the actual you know, energy being put into the situation. The force is gonna be the amount of push or pull that's causing the rotation. So first example, when you grab a hold of the steering wheel to turn your car, you have to rotate the steering wheel, which means the moment you start to pull on the steering wheel, you're causing a torque on the shaft that the steering wheel is connected to. Okay, so imagine I grab the steering wheel, or I already have my hand there, hopefully, because you're driving, right? You already had your hand on the wheel. It's supposed to be two, but let's just say you had one, okay? And it's in such a spot that the center of the steering wheel is about 10 degrees uh, above where your hand is. So my hand is 10 degrees below. It hasn't rotated yet. I've grabbed it just so that the center of the steering wheel is about 10 degrees away from where I've grabbed, okay? And then I pull a 20 pound force on the steering wheel at that moment, okay? 
So then how much torque did we apply to the column of the steering wheel? That's where the torque would be. The steering wheel is connected to the column that it goes into the, into the dash there. So that's where the torque is going to be applied is at that center point. Okay, so then my R vector is going to be the vector that comes from the center out to where I've grabbed the steering wheel, literally to the point I've grabbed. Okay, and then of course F is going to be the, the 20 pound force that I just started to apply. So all we're really concerned with is the amount of torque. In this particular situation, and it actually you'll see in pretty much every situation with these torques that we're doing here, we don't really care so much about the complete vector of the torque <coughs> as we do just the magnitude, the amount of torque being applied. The actual torque vector, when, you, when you're concerned with the vector itself, is when you start getting into more of what is this vector looking like and the, the theory of what torque is doing to the object and things like that on uh, how it applies to the angular momentum and whatnot. <clears throat> okay, so in all of these examples, we're really just doing magnitude of torque. But let's talk about the direction of the torque vector as well. Okay, so I've grabbed the steering wheel and I've started to pull on the steering wheel, right? Torque is R cross F. Well, R is out here, right? It's coming this way. And my F is here. And remember the way cross product works is with your right hand, I should be able to cross one vector into the other one. So notice R cross F is doing this. And which way is my thumb pointing? Into the board. So if I'm turning the steering wheel, right, and I'm pulling down on it, the torque on the column is actually a vector directed into the column in this case. Think about it like when you're turning a screw, right? Righty tighty, lefty loosey. Um, you usually think of it this way as going in. Now, of course, that's, that's not solely because of torque. It's because of the way they've put the incline uh, on the, the spine of the screw. But go with your intuition on this one, okay? It, the screws are typically right-handed screws, okay? Like we're using right-handed systems. So if I, if I do my rotation this way, right, and I do my vector R into F, Notice the torque vector points into the steering column, okay? But we're really only concerned with the amount. So what do I end up doing? I just need to know the angle in between the two vectors because I'm going to use the magnitude of cross product. That's going to be the magnitude of R times the magnitude of F times the sine of the angle that's in between them, right? Theta RF. Theta RF is this angle here, which if you use your parallel lines right here between the center and then with the point of application, you'll notice that uh, the uh, 90 degree angle here, right, is going to match uh, the 90 degree angle on the other side and the 10 degree angle here is going to match the 10 degree angle here, right, those will match. So what I end up with is just 10 degrees plus 90 degrees is 100 degrees between the two vectors, okay? Now, the length of R, the magnitude of the radius, basically, right, is half of the diameter of the steering wheel, and the steering wheel in this case is 1.75 feet. So half of that is the magnitude of my R. My force was 20 pounds, his magnitude is 20, and then times the sine of 100. We come out with 17.23. Now, here's the thing, the units, right? This was in feet, this was in pounds, so it's what we call a foot-pound. And that, that's the, uh, the American unit of torque, is the foot pound. Okay? Now, let's do another one. A pedal is attached to a machine with a bracket, and it's a, an L-shaped bracket. Okay? So if a person pushes down, right, pushes their foot down on the pedal at a 72 degree angle with 35 newtons of force, now notice I'm using newtons this time instead of pounds, right? So I've gone over to metric so that we can have a little bit of experience there. The brackets dimensions are 14 centimeters by nine centimeters off of this center point. So if I measure from this center point out to the edge and then the, the height from that center 
is going to be uh, 9, so it would be more like, like right here, right? 9 centimeters from this center line, and then uh, up right here is 9 centimeters, and this is 14 centimeters on the bracket there. Okay, so then we want to know how much torque is being applied to this point of rotation here, right? To see if whatever that thing is can handle the torque strain maybe, okay? So someone's pushing on this pedal or, or step stool or whatever it happens to be, okay? And we want to know the torque at this point right here. Well, notice that the R is supposed to be defined as the radial vector from the point of rotation. So technically my R is directly like this. This is R right here. And then my force is here, okay? So what I need is the angle between the two vectors and, uh, and I need the magnitude of the R, okay? So here we go. Uh, I'm gonna just translate this over here. I've got a 14 centimeter side, I've got a nine centimeter side, and then this is my R right here. Okay, and then these are at a right angle to each other. The length of this R is gonna be my magnitude, right? So for my torque that I'm gonna calculate the magnitude of, I need to know that magnitude of the R I need to know the magnitude of my force, and I need to know the sine of the angle in between them, RF, theta RF. Okay, so I know the size of the force, right? That's 35 Newtons. And then I know I'm gonna be doing the sine of some angle, and I need some radial component here. Okay, so I'm just gonna use the Pythagorean theorem here to figure out what R is. Right, the, the length of R is going to be the square root of 14 squared plus 9 squared, 196 plus 81, right? Um, so 80 and 197 or 77, so 277, right? So then I'll need to do the square root of that. Square root of two. Let me just write it as square root of 277 for now. Oh, and actually, I can't do that yet. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write it like that, but I need to fix this. Uh, this is in centimeters, right? Typically, the, the uh, unit for uh, torque in metric is the Newton meter not Newton centimeter, okay? So torque, uh, right here, the torque is going to be what we call a Newton meter. Okay, so right now, I've got Newton centimeters, okay? So centimeters being one one hundredth of a meter, right? Whatever this decimal is, uh, let me see, the square root of 277. 16.6 centimeters, right? I need to divide that by 100, and it's 0.166 meters. So here's what I'm gonna do. Right now, I'm just gonna divide by 100 to get the units correct uh, for the metric system here, okay? Because I was, I was in centimeters, and uh, now I'm converting it into meters. Okay, now what about the angle, right? the angle of these two. Well, this point of application right here has the force coming in at a 72 degree angle, right? Okay, so I need the angle in between these two. I'm gonna just continue my diagonal here, right? So if I figure out this angle right here, it's gonna be the same as this angle right here. And then I can simply add in the rest right here as 180 minus 72. Because that's a flat line right there, 72 on this side. 
uh, if I can just figure out the, uh, well, when I can figure out, right? That's, that's 108 degrees is this piece of it. But then the other vector is right here. So I need this little piece of angle right here, which is going to be the same as this angle right here. Uh, because of these two being parallel, right? The, the pedal is, is flat right here. It's parallel with the ground like that. Okay, well, that's no big deal. I can figure out this angle right here by just doing an inverse tangent of 9 fourteenths. Okay, so then the inverse tangent in degrees, inverse tangent of... 9 over 14 is 32.735 degrees. Okay. Plus the 108 degrees that finishes it out, getting it over to the, uh, to the force, right? So the, the angle in between them there. So 108 plus 32 is going to be 140.735 degrees. All right. So let's do this complete calculation here. I'm going to have a square root of 277 divide by 100. So now I'm in meters times 35 and then times the sine of 140 point seven three five degrees okay so I've got three point six eight six Newton meters All right so my torque magnitude is approximately three point six nine Newton meters Doesn't seem like a lot, does it? Uh, newtons and pounds don't necessarily uh, translate the same. Uh, you know, feeling-wise, we're used to feeling pounds. We're not used to thinking in terms of newtons. Okay, last one. A force is applied to the end of a ratchet that's turning uh, a bolt, you know, tightening a bolt, let's say, right? We're gonna pull in this ratchet and if I pull this way, it's going to tighten the bolt uh, into a swing set, let's say, or something like that, right? Okay, so then at what angle phi should we have the force pulling on the ratchet in order to maximize the amount of torque that we're getting, okay? Because think about it. I could, I could uh, get my arm way over here and pull at a shallow angle, right? Like I could get way over here and try to pull this way what if what if i pulled this way right here or what if i got all the way at the end of the ratchet and pulled outward right or should i pull downward like this common sense you can already think of think of pulling on a ratchet right if i'm going to rotate something where am i going to get the most amount of turn out of this the most amount of torque you would think it would be at a at an l shape right well, let's take a look. The torque right here, um, we'll, we'll just call this uh, a radius of R right here. It doesn't really matter however long the ratchet is, right? The, the torque magnitude is equal to whatever the magnitude of the R is, the length of the ratchet, right? Times the amount of force. Neither one of those is changing. I'm not saying do more or less force uh, amount. I'm saying change the angle how I'm pulling on it, right? Well, that means the only thing that it's affecting is this right here because that's the angle between the two things, okay? So neither of these is important. What I really want to do is I want to maximize uh, this piece right here to, to maximize that torque, right? Well, sine of some angle has this kind of shape, right? Where this is phi 
and and this is your um, your output sine phi. Its maximum is right here on this point. Where is that maximum occurring at? Right, it's a maximum of one for sine. Right, that maximum occurs at pi over two, or in other words phi would have to be 90 degrees. But that should make a little bit of sense to you, right? If you're going to rotate something, you're going to want to pull at a right angle. If you pull at a right angle, you're basically tangent to the rotational motion. If you're at some other angle like this and you're pulling down, you're only going to get a little bitty bit of rotation out of that. Or if I'm way up here and I'm pulling outward like this, I'm only going to get until it straightens out like that, right? But if I'm at a right angle, I'm tangent to the circle motion, and I can basically make it move in a circle the most effectively, like that, okay? So the, the math even screams it out for you right there uh, when we're doing this stuff, okay? And, and you can see that that's how a cross product would work. It's sort of not, not exactly the opposite of a dot product, but a lot of its properties feel sort of in the opposite direction, um, not direction, but in the opposite mechanical um, usage that would be sort of the opposite of a dot product. Um, opposite's not a good word, but you get the, you get the idea. Uh, anyway, so I, I hope these examples have shown you a good feeling of what three space can be for vectors and I hope that these examples have also shown you the effectiveness and the usefulness and just the practice of the skill of doing a cross product of two vectors in three space.